This week, as Jim Yong Kim resigns from the World Bank, we talk about the way that central banks steer world development and how. Former Goldman Sachs manager Nomi Prinz, author of Collusion, How Central Banks Rigged the World, and public ownership researcher Thomas Hanna believe that banking and development could look very different. Find out how just ahead. We are storming the Federal Reserve this week on The Laura Flanders Show. It's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The problems we talk about on this program are big enough that what we really need is structural systemic change. Talk about structural change and you think about revolutions. Think about revolutions and you think about, I don't know, people in French caps storming the Bastille. If you were going to storm a central symbol of power and corruption today, where would you go? And what would you do once you got there? It's a thought experiment that Marxist geographer David Harvey posed in a speech I heard this past year, and I've been thinking about it ever since. Here's David. Uh, the difficulty with that is, at a certain point, it doesn't confront the fact that somebody has to go and confront the Federal Reserve. Yeah. You know, and, and this is the difficulty of the, of the thing these days. And actually, Marx talks about this when he's writing about the financial system. He says, you know, the financial system doesn't involve a conflict between labor and capital. It's really a conflict between different forms of capital. And this then kind of says to you, well, there's a real difficulty of revolution here. I mean, in the French, they could, in the French Revolution, they could go storm the Bastille. Uh, you know, in the Russian Revolution, they had the Winter Palace. And then you think to yourself, Okay, let's go storm the Federal Reserve. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, what would we do <laughs> when we got inside of the Federal Reserve? That was David Harvey. I'm happy to have in studio two guests who may have some answers to his question. Nomi Prince is a journalist and former Goldman Sachs director, the author of six books, the latest being Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. Thomas Hanna is research director at the Democracy Collaborative and the author of Our Common Wealth, The Return of Public Ownership in the United States. So, as you can tell, that question has been lingering with me ever since I heard David raise it. Is he right? Is, is it the Fed that we would storm? Well, what's interesting about what he said is that the Federal Reserve, the actual physical building in Washington, is really removed from the sidewalk. And <laughs> there's a bunch <laughs> of policemen in front of it. I was just there on Monday. Um, and it's basically a, a kind of a very austere kind of stay away sort of building. Um, it's the same thing the Bank of England in, in, in London and so forth. So, so there is this sense of So it's actually practically awareness. not so easy. It's not. You have to go through much more um, security measures and like putting your name and books and stuff to get into the Fed than you do to get into the Capitol building. So it's, it's a thing. But, but also what's happened very recently in the last 10 years in particular is the Federal Reserve's created a lot of money. Um, four and a half trillion dollars worth of money that it has effectively bestowed onto the private banking system um, with the idea, the narrative, that it would go to the general public, which of course it hasn't. So the idea of storming the Fed or taking back that money, of course it was electronically created, um, is, is conceptually the, the right place uh, to get to the source. But it's not sitting there in big piles of gold, gold bullion or anything. There, there, there is some, but, but, but the, the multi-trillions of dollars um, are actually sitting with the banks that the Fed is supposed to be regulating um, and used in all sorts of other sort of market and financial asset purposes. What's your take, Thomas, on what David Harvey had to say? Well, I think 10 years ago, President Obama had a meeting with some bankers and he said, my administration is the only thing standing between you and the pitchforks, the people who are out on the streets. And so I think that instead of siding with the bankers against the people, that maybe the government in the next crisis should side with the people, and the storming will be the nationalization or the takeover of many of these Wall Street banks that are going down. And what do you think? They will just say, okay, fine, take this all away from us. I mean, how do you actually seize assets? You're talking about public ownership, municipal ownership. We might not be taking national ownership of things, although we could. Um, but even at the very local level, do people just willingly give up their private companies? Well, at the national level during the last financial crisis, we did actually take over several companies, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, GMAC, uh, parts of Citigroup, AIG, for instance. And when these big banks are going down in a crisis, we have an opportunity. We can either bail them out, give them free cash, or we can take something in exchange for that cash. And that should be ownership shares with voting rights. At the local level, there's ways to get 
uh, ownership of businesses and enterprises. Public referendums have been used in many cases. Uh, the public can, through a voting process, decide to take ownership or to municipalize electric utility, like in Boulder, Colorado, for instance. Uh, there's also ways to get around the legislature. You know, the entire state of Nebraska's energy system was taken over and put into public ownership by the people going around the corporate controlled legislature. They mm -hmm. did referendums and bond issues and so on and so forth. But didn't the um, voters in uh, California, or was it just Los Angeles, vote recently against public banking? Yeah, but it was a very narrow loss. I think around 42% of all people in Los Angeles voted in favor of a public bank, and that was with a very short campaign window. I think they only had about four months to organize the coalition that was in support of a public bank. I think they only raised like fifty or $60,000. There was not enough uh, at that time, and the city council surprised the activists by putting it on the ballot for a referendum. So I think next time Los Angeles might vote for a, a public bank. New York might vote for a public bank. You know, these things are popular, and they're growing around mm, the country. You're, you're nodding. No. I, I'm nodding because I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with, with, with everything you're saying. It, it is true, I'm, I'm, I live in Los Angeles, it is true that um, the measure that came onto the ballot was, was yes, A, a surprise, a good surprise, um, and B, didn't really offer um, everybody sort of who, who wanted this public bank enough time to get the word out mm -hmm. to the general public. What they did manage to do is, yes, get to a very, very close vote. But the thing with the public bank, uh, to, which, you know, just to segue really uh, quickly, is that rather than having, and to go back to something else you said, a, a bailout of a larger institution that has our deposits or the majority of deposits in the country uh, throughout these institutions and then have the Fed come in during a crisis and say, here's some money, do whatever you want with it because otherwise, as you've said, um, and as the Treasury Department just said, it was run by a former banker from Goldman Sachs and so forth, otherwise everything's going to fall apart. So here's some money, you know, just, just take it, which is effectively what happened as opposed to bailing out either the individuals, the mortgage holders, or et cetera, at the crux of that crisis, and then reforming the system, then doing something else and separating those deposits from those speculative activities within banks banks and not having the tie. And one way to do that is have more money in public banks who actually have been shown to adhere to the public good, the public demand, to actual real economic growth at the foundational level of our economy that allows people um, to have jobs, to, to move about, to, to be involved in research and development projects, and to build a stronger country. And now, but do those nice public banks that you might have in your state or your town have any chance of standing up against, you say, the central bankers have rigged the world? Well, this is, this is a problem. If we look at something like North Dakota, which is the only state that has a public bank, one of the reasons they have it is because they take the tax rece receipts from people and from companies that, that operate there, and then they utilize those back into the economy. So they're able to effectively work their economy in a very positive manner. And this is just not knowledge um, to lots of people. The Federal Reserve, of course, doesn't have that uh, necessity. So they talk about bailing out the private banks as somehow being good for the public, mm -hmm. but they're not giving the money or requiring that money go in any sort of extra meaningful way to the public. So it, it, it's, it's not even true. Want to come in on that? I mean, the scale problem, it seems to me your, your local public banking system is up against it when, it t when we're talking about the global economy. But, but maybe Nomi's right. Yeah, well, I think the Bank of North Dakota shows that it plays a role in a banking ecosystem right. uh, in that state. So the Bank of North Dakota essentially works with local banks, with c credit unions, community banks. It backstops them, as Nomi said, that you know all state revenues go in to capitalize the bank and, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to make structures and integrated structures of public banks at lo different levels, integrated with local banks. You know, maybe if we in the next crisis took over one of the large Wall Street banks, you know, that could support a network of regional public banks at the state level, so on and so forth. So if you were to go back to David Harvey's question about storming the Fed, and the question is, what would we do there? You're kind of saying, well, you'd maybe take inventory, but then you'd move on to the local banking systems. Is that right? Well, I, I, I am saying that when the, the way the current Federal Reserve System is structured, it, it, it works for the large private banks. It doesn't just work for them and provide the money in, in an emergency. It provides the money all the time. It agrees to their mergers. It has allowed bigger banks to take over smaller banks since its inception because it gets to have a say in that. And what it always says is, yes, you can do that. So you, you, it has created and been involved in creating the larger banks that were powerful to begin with because they were the ones who actually required the Fed to be there for them. So we could do something completely different. I mean, we could have a Fed run completely differently, right? Yeah. I mean, in the last crisis, the Federal Reserve did certain things that actually it's not allowed to do anymore. So the Dodd-Frank legislation actually, for all of its weaknesses in certain areas, 
bound the hands of the Federal Reserve to do some of these equity purchases to individual companies and banks that was used during the last financial crisis. So you can, you know, through legislation in the federal government, you can put certain conditions and restrictions and whatnot on the Federal Reserve um, to make it act differently, potentially. We've had people on the show that were talking about occupying the Fed, meaning like Occupy Wall Street. And I thought of that when I read your book, Nomi, and you said, you know, if the 20th century was the, correct me if I'm wrong, the century of Wall Street, the 21st is the century of the central bankers. Is that what you said? That's right, because since effectively the financial crisis leading up to the financial crisis, it has been the global major developed country central banks that have effectively created a lot of the seed money to allow the private banks to sustain the types of risks that they sustain and continue to speculate as they do um, with deposits or so this core idea of government support even though they're supposed to be independent from the Fed um, as, as something that they have to their benefit. So, and, and the Fed by, by no law, and there's some restrictions that come in here and there although they can sort of get around some of them if there were an emergency because ultimately they have an emergency clause in their charter. Yes, Congress can take them back, that back um, and do things but, 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 but they don't. They sort of trust this, this relationship. So the Fed has, as to central banks, no actual limitation. There is no law in any country that limits the amount of money they can manufacture in what they deem to be a crisis situation. That's a lot of power. So great. Let's get the printing presses running and feed everybody and house everybody and, I don't know, give everyone free school. Yeah, I, I mean, quantitative easing, the process that the Federal Reserve used to create money uh, during the last financial crisis can be used in different circumstances for different purposes. There it, isn't that one of the things that Jeremy Corbyn proposed, kind of? Yeah, quantitative easing the for the people. The um, and there's also a discussion of quantitative easing for the planet. So my, some of my colleagues at the Democracy Collaborative are working on a proposal that perhaps we could use quantitative easing to buy out some of the fossil fuel companies to uh, mitigate the climate crisis over the next uh, decade or so. Right, because at the end of the day, what the Fed has done by quantitative easing, it has created money and it has decided who it gives it to and what it receives in return. And that has been predominantly uh, financial institutions and the largest private banks throughout the world, the Fed and other, and other central banks. So yes, if you were to go with that, before 10 years, we didn't have this. We didn't have this like make up money. We actually did borrow and we still borrow. Mm -hmm. um, governments still borrow, companies still borrow to do stuff, but, but the Fed, has shown and, and, and colluded with other central banks to do this extra exercise of manufacturing multiple trillions of dollars. You take $22 trillion that's currently on offer by the major developed central banks of the world to their financial systems, and you leverage that by 10 times, you have not, you know, you, you have a lot of money to fix many, many problems um, and grow economies throughout the world. Now, what they would say, I mean, I have no idea if they would say this, but I'm imagining they might say, you're giving us a really hard time, but the system, which is to say capitalism, did not crash, did not collapse in 2008. We're all still here. People still have their jobs. Businesses are still ticking over. Um, think twice before you critique what we're up to. We've actually held it all together. I, I have that question posed to me by by people at these institutions and, and, and by, you know, just in, in real, on, on a daily basis um, and, and, and since the financial crisis. And the reality is, we don't really know what would have happened, but what we do know, and I, I wrote an entire book on this called It Takes a Pillage, which we actually talked yes, about, I think, did. on your show 10 years ago, um, was that it would have been cheaper if you're going to go the route of creating money to buy up all of the subprime mortgages that were at risk at the crux of the financial crisis, which effectively were more at risk because of how much they were manipulated by derivatives and other things throughout the financial system, and literally buy all of them. <laughs> And you would have spent a fraction in a shorter period of time than what has been spent and what continues to be on subsidy to the financial system throughout the world. Now, we're always told subsidies are a tricky and unstable thing and can't be kept up forever. Can this uneasy, fragile situation that you've just described survive? It, it, it it has been surviving because they don't know what else to do. It's like you stick a whole pool of money as the carpet underlying the financial system. And when the Fed has just recently tried to kind of leg out of that even a little bit, and other central banks have not. So there, again, this goes through this a global uh, process. Um, they've, they've run into some issues. They don't want to dump all of the bonds that they bought and receive the money back from the banks. That would create actually a mass catastrophe. They've created um, a catch-22 for themselves. They could divert it to public banks. They could divert it to public say, works. I have a lot of ideas of what they could do. Yeah, well, they did save capitalism, but 
they saved capitalism. So, you know, the, what, the things that they put in place after the financial crisis haven't really changed the structure of the system uh, in, in any significant way. So, you know, the banks are bigger than they were before. We're bound to have another financial crisis at some point. We don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know how bad, but there will be another financial crisis because, you know, the, what's been put in place just, just isn't sufficient. I think everyone knows that. Uh, so we need to be starting to think differently. What are the structural interventions that we can So are we thinking differently? I mean, we've got a new congr congressional majority in the House. We've got some campaigns that are getting into gear uh, this year and the next. Are the new crop of politicians in this country or internationally um, seeing some of these possibilities, running on any of these kind of major uh, structural change plans? I think so. I, I, I think there's a great hunger in the new crop of politicians, especially in the House, uh, for some new ideas, for some really big interventions. You look at the stuff around the Green New Deal. Some of that might involve public banking. Uh, that a lot of people are talking about that. So I really think there's an opportunity here to get some really freshing ideas into the discussion. In the last financial crisis, 33 senators, I believe it was, voted to break up the big banks as an amendment to Dodd-Frank. It didn't pass, but that's it's a huge majority of senators, if you think about it. So we can build on that in the, in the next crisis or, or in the coming years. And national ownership or public ownership of certain national institutions has been very popular in the British Labour Party manifesto, from what I understand. And, and, pub, and postal banking here in the United States has been popular amongst some senators to give the post office, which is a publicly owned enterprise, the ability to provide banking services, which is common around the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Globally, is there mounting pressure for any of this real change? Um, well, well, I think globally we, we, we've seen places like even, even in Germany where they actually have a public banking system and in, in, in China where it's not quite a public banking system but, but where the central bank actually supports the building of infrastructure uh, within China and, and within the trade alliances of countries around China and stuff. So there, there are um, numbers of other places where the idea of, of using capital for the actual public good and economic stability and real growth um, is actually put into practice. And with respect to green, um, you know, there was a BRICS Bank that was created a number of years ago, I talk about it in the book, it's now called the New Development Bank, but the idea is that those countries uh, get together and the money that they raise within that bank, that infrastructure bank, only can go to green development projects. That was basically one of the charters um, of that recently created institution. So take so over the have... IMF and make it work for us. Right. Sounds good to me. Something like that. And, and the UK had a green investment bank publicly owned and then they privatized it um, uh, under the, the last government. Um, so it, it is an option. There are banks, Banco Popular in Costa Rica uh, is a leading ecological lender in that country because it was the will of the people. They have a popular planning process uh, that allows them to determine what the bank should do and they decided to go green. All right, you two have accomplished the perfect job which is to take me from sort of knife edge of anxiety to actually feeling kind of encouraged. So thank you both, it's great to have you. Nomi Prince is the author of Collusion, Tom Thomas Hanna of Our Commonwealth. You can find more of my interviews with them and more information about their books at our website. Thanks for watching. Thanks, you two. Thank that you. was great. Thank you very much, Liz. Make the lot for the register. Let the money disappear. Stay like the river. Mix it with the blood and tears. Goes out. years since the Great Recession, lessons have been learned and the economy has improved, right? Or maybe not. Nomi, your book begins with you going in 2015, probably leaving the Laura Flanders Show studio to go right on over to the Fed, the IMF, the World Bank. What did they want to hear and did they listen? <laughs> um, the they have this conference um, in Washington. It's closed door just amongst the, the, those, those three groups. And it's like a day at the Fed, a day at the IMF, a day at the World Bank, and you know lunches and dinners and stuff in between. Um, and I was asked to speak in the opening plenary at the Fed, where it starts, um, right after Janet Yellen, about the topic that they selected for me, which was, how come Wall Street's not helping Main Street? And when I first got the email to talk about this, I said, are you sure you got the right know me? Because I've been very critical <laughs> of the Fed for many, many years. Oh. And they're like, no, we, we, we want to bring in you know, a critical voice. 
I'm like, okay, so I, one of the things that I said to this room full of central bankers who were just starting to see a lot of more cracks in their economies throughout the world um, was that Wall Street isn't helping Main Street because I say to the central bankers and the Fed officials in the room, you never made them. Right. You never said, here's a boatload of money, here's some cheap rates and funds to get you going for an emergency, which started in the fall of 2008, now 10 years ago, um, and you got to give back. You got to give to small businesses, you got to restructure small individual loans and so forth. No ties attached mm. to that money. And is that what the central bankers and the Fed are supposed to do? Is that what they were set up to do? And what are they exactly? That's a really good question. Theoretically, um, they were set up for, for multiple different reasons. And we're um, going back over 100 years now for the Right. Fed. So the, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, this right, in 1913 um, in December. And one of the things that was the point of it, supposedly, um, was to be an emergency lender of last resort, such that when a banking collapse happened when there was a major problem with getting money around the country, in fact, there would be sort of something in Washington that could independently help that maneuver. Mm -hmm. And then onto that, there was the added idea that the Fed was in this position whereby setting the cost of money, interest rates up and down, which is one of their jobs, they could sort of jigger what was unemployment versus inflation or, or how much things cost and make sure that things were growing at a reasonable rate and that people were employed. Mm -hmm. But that was not really the reason that the Fed was set up. It truly was set up to provide capital to the largest Wall Street banks that wanted the Fed to exist for that purpose. After the recession, we were given this promise that we would have something called quantitative easing, QE. Um, it sounded great, right? Easing, we all needed it. Um, it never stopped. That's, and what did it do? That's right. It, it just it just became global. And tell so, people what it was. So quantitative easing, which it, it does sound nice when you say it. I think it's just a completely wonky term, but 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 it is easing. It's basically creating a situation where there's an easy flow of money, not just with interest rates that they set at, at short ends of the curve, so for three month money, right. but 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 for ten year treasuries, for thirty year treasuries, for five year treasury, and so forth. And the idea would be that you can borrow in the future and not pay as much interest back. And the idea would be that if that's the case, people will borrow, people will invest in their businesses, corporations will invest, everybody will be happy, the economy will grow. That's what quantitative easing was created to do. The Fed creates money out of nowhere, electronically sort of flipping a switch, and uses that money to buy bonds in the system, to buy mortgage bonds, which are toxic at the time, from the system, and give cash literally, to banks in return. With the it's, idea that they'll do something with that. With the idea, but going back to my point before, the idea, but not the requirement, that they do something with it. Um, so it wasn't just the Fed. Our financial crisis, um, the cause of which was what Wall Street did to rejigger um, people's subprime mortgages, today they're doing with corporate loans, other topics. The sale of derivatives, the That's mortgage right. crisis, all that. It, it was so massive, actually that it required what has now become a, a global quantitative easing program of today, $22 trillion, so much more than the GDP of the United States. The Fed itself still subsidizes, I call it a subsidy, they call it quantitative easing, uh, quantitative easing amount to the tune of $4.1 trillion, at its height it has been $4.5 trillion. Is this, they offer I mean, this. It, for, for lack of a better word, it sounds like a public subsidy. I mean, let's be clear where this money is coming from is public money, isn't it? It's, it's kind of not coming from anywhere except the reason it connects to the public is that because the Fed creates this money, it has the ability to give it to banks. Banks turn around, they buy treasury bonds with it at lower rates, which means the government is borrowing money at lower rates so they can borrow more, more cheaply. They go to the Wall Street banks, the Wall Street banks bring them back to the Fed who has paid Wall Street banks to effectively purchase the government's debt. So there is a public uh, part of this triangle, but the reality is if you take out the Fed and you take out the banks, the government wouldn't have needed to issue that debt. That debt is sitting on the books, or some of it, two and a half trillion of which is just treasury debt, is literally sitting on the books of the Federal Reserve, other ways different countries throughout the world doing Nothing. The damage that has happened is that around the world, as this money has been infused kind of freely into the financial system by the Fed, it's also required other central banks around the world to figure out what they need to do, either in cooperation or collusion, as I talk about it, or in 
protection right. um, for themselves. So one country that I was just in actually was Brazil. They've had a lot of turmoil uh, politically in their system over these 10 years. Why? Ultimately, um, we had a financial crisis in 2008. It caused stuff to happen in Brazil. It caused leadership to change because countries outside of us can't manufacture the kind of money we've mm -hmm. done because it would create real inflation as it did over the years, which creates real economic burdens to real people. They get annoyed, they vote out, and they get upset, and they protest in the streets, which is actually what we're still seeing around the world. The reason for a lot of that is because people don't sit there and wonder what the Central Bank of Brazil is doing every day or what the Fed's doing every day. They have lives to run. Yeah. Um, but they understand that there's this economic unease and this instability, and where they take it out is on their elected officials. And if the elected officials aren't helping them, they vote them out. So where are we now? Um, they rigged the world. We're in a new, as you say, very unstable and dangerous normal. Um, is this where we stay? Markets have been going crazy. What's on the horizon? Well, that's right. What's happening now is markets that have been the recipient of a lot of this extra cash, right? It goes for, through the banks. They're not giving it to real people and real businesses. Where does it go to speculative endeavors like stocks? Um, Banks buy back their own stock. Corporations buy back their own stock. They use money for these purposes. So, so that's an issue. But at some point, that money, it was artificial to begin with. It's being used to prop up a financial system. That's an artificial stimulant. That means that the real growth that would actually put in real money into the economy to really create value, let's say, for those stocks and for the economy, isn't really there. And so that's one reason why the markets are starting to buckle and notice that, and why all of these central banks are having some real issues um, as to how they can exit this this catch-22 that they've all created by dumping this money on the world and not having a real plan for it and not knowing how to reverse course. So the future? So I think we're going to have a lot of uh, corporate debt problems and, and, and defaults and everything along the lines of what we had into the financial crisis 10 years ago. It might not look the same way. It might not be a drop, like one solid drop, but it could be pieces of a lot of instability, a lot of voting nationalists, a lot of economic uncertainty um, for a number of years to come. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. The book is Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. Nomi Prince is our guest. You can find out more and get your, help, get your hands on a copy of the book through our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Thanks. Nomi, thank you. Thank you.